August 6th, 1945. Little boy explodes over Hiroshima, killing 70,000 people. August 9th, 1945. Fat man detonates over Nagasaki, killing roughly 45,000 people. These explosions and the horrific aftermath that followed punctuated history. But the atomic bomb also seemed to plant the seeds of an environmental reawakening that exploded during the 1960s and 70s. With the increased post-war suburbanization and industrialization came escalating anxieties about nuclear fallout and global destruction. Specifically, the American public realized that with the help of the bomb, they now had the power to drastically alter their environment. Indeed, in 1953, this concern was realized with a botched test of Shot Harry, or as it would come to be nicknamed, Dirty Harry. Due to unforeseen wind conditions and poor planning, Shot Harry contributed to massive offsite contamination. Its fallout was so vast that it managed to drift all the way from Nevada to the East Coast. No area in the country was immune to its reach, and the soil and air quickly bore traces of radiation. This uncontrollable fallout catalyzed a new environmental concern for atomic bombs, and added to an even greater trend of reconsidering the resilience of humans and their environments at the hands of modern technologies. In 1962, with the enactment of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, all above-ground nuclear testing was banned. The treaty satiated some worry concerning radioactive materials in the environment, and, as an unintended consequence, allowed the concerned public to redirect their newfound environmental conscience towards other environmental problems. This redirection of resources towards broader environmental issues was influenced in part by a growing number of authors who capitalized on nuclear anxiety to heighten the urgency of challenging environmental degradation. Essentially, the atomic bomb supplied a rhetorical tool belt to a young environmental movement allowing authors and environmentalists to reveal the fragility of the earth at the hands of humans. Although it was wielded by ecologists like William Vogt and Fairfield Osborne in the late 1940s, the rhetorical tool of nuclear destruction most notably pervades the successful words of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. In Silent Spring, Rachel Carson charges her words with nuclear anxiety from the outset. In the second chapter of her book, she writes, Strontium-90, released through nuclear explosions into the air, in time takes up its abode in the bones of a human being, there to remain until its death. Similarly, chemicals sprayed on croplands or forests or gardens lie long in the soil, entering into living organisms, passing from one to another in a chain of poisoning and death. Carson imbues her environmental argument with imagery of death poisoning and nuclear destruction, using this rhetoric to tap into the American citizen's underlying anxiety of nuclear catastrophe, and ultimately highlighting the importance of challenging indiscriminate pesticide and herbicide use. Carson's contemporary, Paul Ehrlich, seems to draw a connection between rampant population growth and the atomic bomb with the title of his 1968 book, Population Bomb suggesting that if left unchecked, population growth could lead to a catastrophe on the scale analogous to nuclear Armageddon. From Vogt to Carson to Ehrlich, the language of nuclear fear pervades the writings of environmentalists. Especially with Silent Spring, the early environmental movement seemed to have gained traction by latching onto pervasive public fears of the atomic bomb, and then redirecting those fears towards the issue of human-caused destruction of the natural world. The use of nuclear rhetoric in the 1960s seems to echo the hyperbole of some modern environmentalists today. But recently, the use of catastrophic hyperbole and manipulation of cultural anxieties has led to a solidification of mindsets rather than environmental progress. With Ehrlich's release of the population bomb came the equally dramatic opposition of free market ideology championed by Julian Simon. Gore's desire to halt climate change was countered by Bush and Cheney's questioning of whether humans were even changing the climate, and whether it even mattered. Today, Trump calls climate change a hoax, while Obama bans offshore drilling. 
Using apocalyptic metaphors and eye-catching hyperbole definitely mobilizes a movement, but it also seems to concretize a radical opposition that seeks to avoid change. So considering that every environmental action leads to an equal and opposite reaction, how can we make meaningful and lasting progress? Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, like the video, comment, or just share it with friends on Facebook or whatever other social media platform you enjoy. Seriously, anything helps. If you really enjoy the video, you can also support me on Patreon, where every dollar really goes to helping me grow this channel. Finally, check out last week's video on Lord of the Rings and quiet environmentalism.